Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're watching this. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution, as well as the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. And I'd like to welcome you to the Hoover Institution's virtual policy briefing series, backed by popular demand. These briefings provide an opportunity for you to hear directly from our most distinguished scholars here at the Hoover Institution. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. As a reminder, we will be taking audience questions, and I encourage you to submit yours. It's very easy to do that. You just go to the bottom of your screen where the Q&A button is located. You just type in a question, send it to us, and we will put it into the queue. Now, joining us for today's briefing are two Hoover Fellows who are quite brilliant when it comes to the topic of courts and constitutional law, and that would be Hoover Fellows Michael McConnell and John Yu. Michael McConnell is a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution. He's also the director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. He previously served as a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, which means that at the time he was on the court, one of his colleagues was Neil Gorsuch. We're also joined by John Yu. John is a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution and professor of law uh, across the Bay at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, better known to some of you as Bolt. John was a counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. And he also in a past life was a clerk on, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, John, the DCA, which is the DC, uh, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, referred to some as the uh, farm club for the Supreme Court. And when he was doing that, one of his fellow clerks was a promising young jurist named Amy Coney Barrett. So Michael and John, thank you for joining us today, taking time out of your busy schedules. And let's talk about Judge, soon to be Justice Barrett. The news out of Washington this morning is that the Senate Judiciary Committee forwarded her nomination to the floor, um, did not have an actual committee vote on it. Um, the Senate Democrats, the members of the Judiciary Committee, had threatened either not to show up or walk out. And so Chairman Graham just decided to do it in the executive committee and it was passed on. So very few fireworks. And I, I'm kind of a two minds when I watch this and I want to get your thoughts on this. One mind to me says that, you know, this was kind of refreshing in that we were free from the drama and the theatrics and code pink people being dragged out of the proceedings and you know being taken down an avenue of how much Amy Comey Barrett drank in high school and what was in her yearbook and things like that. On the other hand, I think this was also an anomaly, an anomaly given kind of how unique she was as a nominee, but also that it was shoehorned right here at the end of an election. So your thoughts, gentlemen, is, it, is this kind of a preview of better nominations to be had, or should we just view this as a one-off given the circumstances surrounding it? Bill, you just described Berkeley too. That sounds like what it's like to teach here as you've got all kinds of people showing up and it's all kinds of outfits. People have to be dragged out. People have to be... <laughs> forced to sit down. Uh, and it's been really quiet because of COVID, because you know people can't gather, people can't show up, there's no events, there's no audiences. Uh, so I think that has a lot to do with it. I don't see Amy Coney Barrett representing a kind of a, a, a piece or a consensus to change the way we've done things. I think it's as you described, I think the politics of it uh, overwhelmed the usual theater we've seen uh, with Kavanaugh, even with Gorsuch, uh, certainly with uh, Alito and Roberts. And that is, I think, when uh, on the first day of the hearings, you could tell, I think, that the Democrats already had thrown in the towel. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why they made the hearings about the Affordable Care Act, because they were uh, pitching the hearings more at the November 3rd elections, because the legal issues involved with the Affordable Care Act, uh, to me, aren't that important as a constitutional matter, are going to represent a tiny, tiny proportion of the important issues that uh, Justice Barrett, I hope, is going to face when she gets on the Supreme Court. So I think once you know, so, uh, we have a next vacancy, COVID is over, unfortunately, I think you're gonna see us go back to something more like Kavanaugh and less like a Barrett. Mm -hmm. Michael? Well, of course, it all depends on who is elected president uh, this fall and, and what party has the Senate. Uh, if uh, Joe Biden is elected and the Democrats hold the Senate, uh, the confirmation hearings are going to be very perfunctory, rapid, polite, civil, and uh, the nominees are going to say nothing. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, just like uh, the, the old days. If, if, uh, if there are a cross party that is either a Republican president with a Democratic Senate or the other way around, 
uh, I think we're going to see nothing but uh, fireworks. Now, I hope that Kavanaugh was an exception because that was so exceptionally um, defamatory and improper and and over uh, out of the uh, out of the ordinary. But you know, I would expect it to go back to to something like what we saw with uh, Gorsuch or Alito. Right. So I did a little homework, gentlemen. I was curious about uh, the question of senators who voted across the aisle in the uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, here's what I discovered. Lindsey Graham actually voted for Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor. He was the only Republican to break ranks. Three Democrats voted for Stephen Breyer back in the 1990s. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, uh, was an 180 committee vote. Uh, even Clarence Thomas managed to get one Democratic vote. That was uh, Dennis Cassini, De Cassini at a time an Arizona Democrat. Yeah, it, was um, Alan Dennis. it was Alan Dixon. Okay, right. Um, but as we look at uh, Amy Coney Barrett's uh, uh, performance at the at the proceedings, looking forward, uh, I'm just wondering if she is the model, especially if you're a Republican president trying to trying to push this through, because she seems to she had two things going for her here that uh, some past nominees did. Number one, she had been vetted rather recently, I believe she was vetted for the uh, circuit court in 2017, so still fresh. And secondly, she had this very compelling personal story, so it made it very hard to engage in character assassination with her. So. The question, gentlemen, if you are a Republican president looking down the road, is ACB really the model that you, you want to look at? Um, Shall I be going first again? I, so uh, two things. I think one thing you've seen in the Trump years is um, the disappearance of the idea of voting someone because they're well qualified, have a good character, good experience, and so on. It's not just um, Amy Coney Barrett. It also uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. But going on even before then, uh, Alito, Roberts, you saw a, high, a large number of Democrats, I think, vote against them uh, simply because they disagreed what they thought their views were going to be once right. they got on the court. I think Republicans were slower to that idea. So as you said, um, Bill, there were a large, a, a high number of Republicans voted for uh, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, you still had some even by the Obama years, some Republicans voting for uh, Kagan. Uh, but I think after this presidency, you see the uh, much more tighter party line voting for each nominee. Uh, so in a way, I think that kind of freed Trump because I think Barrett uh, is no stealth nominee. Uh, she's been very clear, I think, about what she thinks. I mean, she might be the most openly originalist nominee we've had to the Supreme Court since Bork. And we saw what happened to him. Uh, he's, I think he's certainly, she's certainly much more openly originalist, I think, when she's been nominated when Justice Scalia, her role model and mentor was when he was uh, confirmed. Uh, she's also been extremely open, I think, about what you do as a judge, if your moral views conflict with what the law requires you to do, how to think about precedent. Uh, she's even written a little bit about Roe versus Wade, but openly discussed Roe versus Wade during the hearings. So I think in a weird way, to, to me anyway, the weird dynamic might be these uh, these more strict party line voting on judges, a president might just say, well, then to hell with trying to attract anyone from the other side. I'm just going to appoint, I mean, nominate people who are more openly conservative. And maybe it might remind us about if President Biden may win. Maybe he'll do the same with his nominees, too. Right. Uh, for those who are just joining us, uh, came to this late, I'm Bill Whalen, and you're watching a Hoover Institution Virtual Policy Briefing with Michael McConnell and John Yu. Uh, and again, if you're arriving late, uh, we'd like you to join the conversation here in a few minutes. Uh, go to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, write in a question, and we'll try to get it to John and Michael if we can. So gentlemen, let's talk a bit about the mechanics of joining the Supreme Court. So she will be confirmed, the assumption is, on Monday. Do you then just run across the street to the court and put on a black robe and start participating? When do you actually go to the court? And also, how does she build her team of clerks and actually get herself up and running in a really short time, uh, time frame? Well, I do think she'll, uh, she'll get started very quickly. Um, she probably, she might well not vote. I don't know, it's up to her. She may, but she might well not vote on the handful of cases that have already been uh, argued but I'm sure she'll want to cast a vote on the cert petitions that are waiting there because deciding what cases the court will hear is one of the most uh, consequential things uh, that a justice uh, does. And there's some very important uh, uh, petitions that have been filed. And then she'll, she'll uh, 
uh, then she'll get in. So, you know, uh, as to clerks, I don't know. I'm busy. I'm writing some letters of recommendation for people. Even now, I have, I hope she hasn't made up her mind, uh, but she, chances are she'll do, if, if uh, she'll probably take some of her best clerks from, from her service on the Seventh Circuit. Uh, often there are young lawyers who help with the confirmation that impress the new justice and they're hired. I don't think she will not let grass grow under her feet. What do you think, John? I always thought there's this funny uh, dynamic right after you get uh, the vote out of the Senate, you rush like hell to the nearest judge to get your oath of office taken because someone might change their mind. <laughs> so there's always this really immediate one, usually with uh, Chief Justice Roberts, I think. And then there's going to be a ceremonial one later where there's a lot of people invited and so on. So I bet she takes the oath on at the end of the day, Monday, which means, as you say, well, she puts the black, she's ready to go to work on Tuesday morning. And I agree with Mike, you're going to have a probably a mix of new clerks and clerks who already have Supreme Court experience. I, I would just add one thing. I think the cases that might be the most important that are waiting uh, for her, and there's going to be a deluge of them, are going to be election cases. You know, there we just saw on Monday the Supreme Court denied cert in this uh, really interesting case coming out of Pennsylvania about whether the Pennsylvania courts can change the deadline by which votes have to get in. There's gonna be a lot more of those cases coming out of all the battleground states. And then if it's a close election, right? Cause she, you know, this is gonna start just in a week and a half. And then right. if there are, a, if, if it's a close election and there are battleground states with some of these votes, there's gonna be a lot more uh, litigation in the Supreme Court about hanging chads and impressions and ballots and what counts as a real vote. So the faster she gets there, the faster she can, uh, she could well be the decisive vote in all in, in those election law cases. Let me ask you a bit of an offbeat question, gentlemen. Uh, she is a product of Notre Dame law. She taught at Notre Dame law. She can't put a shamrock on her uh, black robe when she sits on the court. But do you think that she might be looking for clerks who do not necessarily have Ivy League backgrounds? Because that is part of the attraction to her, I think, for Trump supporters, at least, that she is not Ivy League. She is not seen as sort of of, of the system, if you will. I certainly hope so. Um, our system has been too Harvard-Yale uh, dominated and we needed justices who did not go to those two schools. And I would expect her to do that. Clarence Thomas currently is, uh, I think, the only justice who goes out of his way uh, to look for talent from uh, uh, the hinterlands. Mm -hmm. okay, John? I, I, I can make a comment about the, the robes <laughs> because <laughs> they're not on the outside but you never get to see the linings. And so my recollection is they actually have linings with some of their school insignia on them. So I'm sure Notre Dame already has her measured for her, a shamrock green internal <laughs> lining on her robe, without a doubt. <laughs> Very good. Uh, a reminder, folks, we will be going to Q&A in a few minutes. So again, if you want to ask a question to John and Michael, please uh, get it in. Uh, gentlemen, there is a presidential debate tonight. Um, I'm curious about this. You don't advise the president, but if Donald Trump were to stand before the American people tonight and make his best case argument for the courts, what should he say? I'd say Trump can just go up and say, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I've kept my word. I, I actually, remarkably so. I mean, he was the first president to issue a list right. of people that he would pick from for the Supreme Court, and he pretty much kept to it. Uh, the other thing you'd say, look what he did with the lower courts. Not only did he make up that list, but the people he appointed to the lower courts, about 200, which is an incredible number, and Senator Mitch McConnell has a lot to do with that too, are very similar to the kind of people that he appointed to the Supreme Court and that he chose from. I, I, I think they, he tried to pick some of the most young, aggressive, uh, originalist, originalist judges that we've ever seen any president nominate. I think he outdid the Bushes and President Reagan even in his, in his sort of fidelity to that principle of picking judges. Okay, that sounds good. But Michael, can you make that a little more relatable to the American voter? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm not no offense, exactly. Jim. I'm not exactly Mr. Uh, relatable to the American voter, but but I would just want to point out that uh, that Trump's commitment and the people who've been assisting him in naming judges is not been uh, to Republican or right wing or partisan outcomes. Uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, but rather to a certain methodology, which is based upon uh, text and history, uh, originalism, but uh, and, and I hope a generous dollop of judicial restraint to leave uh, decisions that the Constitution does not actually speak for to the democratic uh, process. And what that means is that some of these, nom these nominees are not all going to come to the same conclusion. And people who are looking to see Trump, the Trump side or the Republican side win in all these cases, I think will be disappointed. I'm, I'm glad they will be uh, disappointed. It just not isn't true that one party or the other has their partisan positions aligning all the time with the, with the Constitution. I think the Affordable Act case that John mentioned a moment ago and that the Democrats on the committee spent so much time mm -hmm. on is an example of that where although the case was brought by a Republican attorney general and joined by almost all of the Republican state attorneys general, uh, I don't expect the Republican nominated justices on the court to vote that way because the, you know, the legal argument is just so, so weak. And, and, uh, uh, and, and that's a good thing. And, and notice also how often Kavanaugh and Gorsuch were opposed to each other. Their, their rate of agreement was the lowest of any pair of justices named by, this, uh, by the same party, let alone the same president in a very long time. Uh, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. It shows that the, uh, that the commitment here is to a methodology and not to an outcome. Yeah, let's After Mike and I are done appealing to the American people, we've just won the election for Biden, I think. <laughs> I was going to, I'd like to ask you, let's, uh, let's make Joe Biden's case now, which I would say in effect is what? It's the argument for judicial activism over judicial restraint. No? This is very interesting because he's actually resisted the idea of uh, naming anybody uh, in terms of a pool. And I think you see some of the divisions in the Democratic Party that also struck them when they were appointing judges before, both under Obama and Clinton, which is uh, all we know that Biden has said publicly about who we pick is based on gender and race. He hasn't said I'm uh, picking anybody of a certain ideology, although we assume they would be progressive, although I think progressives themselves are having trouble figuring out what their judicial ideology is these days. But he said he's going to appoint a black woman. That's right. all we uh, know about this uh, about the Supreme Court. In fact, uh, but actually that gives you an idea. There, there are a few very important high profile black women in law. For example, there's uh, Justice of the California Supreme Court. There's the Attorney General of New York. Uh, you know, so you can go through and figure that out uh, who would be on his list. But it's a, it's again, this conflict between their ideals and then their commitment to racial and gender diversity that you see come forefront, even in an issue like picking justices and judges. Mm -hmm. Michael? So I think it's a tell, it's an objective fact, a little bit like, you know, looking at Germany, uh, how many people escaped from West Berlin into East Berlin? Uh, and, and no matter how much you want to argue about which system was better, that was the proof. Well, Republicans love to talk about the judiciary and what they're looking for and the, and the phil philosophical positions that they're going to be taking and, and so forth. Uh, Democrats tend to keep their uh, cards close to their vest. And I think that's an indication that on this issue, I'm not saying on all issues, certainly not on all issues, but on this issue, it's actually the Republicans who are the more popular party because I think the American people don't want the courts just making things up. They really do believe in what the civics textbooks tell us, which right. is the job of the judges is to interpret the law and not to make it. Okay, one final question for the two of you, then we'll go to audience Q&A. And thank you, everybody, who's put in questions so far. And again, you have a few more minutes to put in a question if you'd like. And again, you do that by going to the Q&A button and typing away. Uh, here's the question, gentlemen. Joe Biden is on 60 Minutes this weekend. So is President Trump doing interviews. Uh, he was asked about court packing, and here's what he had to say. It's a little bit of a long quote, but bear with me, but it's relevant to this conversation. Biden said the following, quote, 
If elected, what I will do is I'll put together a national commission of scholars, constitutional scholars, Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative, and I will ask them to over 180 days come back to me with recommendations as to how to reform the court system because, Vice President's words, it's getting out of whack. The way in which it's being handled, it's not about court packing. There's a number of other things that our constitutional scholars have debated, and I've looked to see what recommendations and commission might make. So gentlemen, you two are constitutional scholars. Let's put you on that, uh, that Blue Ribbon National Commission. What would you like to have that commission talk about? What would be your suggestions as to how to fix a court that is supposedly out of whack? So I think we need a constitutional amendment fixing the size of the court at nine so that we don't have this kind of manipulation and partisan shenanigans that's uh, going on right now, fixing the number at nine and then creating, I think 18, an 18 year old term lim limit is what makes the most sense so that every two years on a regular schedule, there will be a vacancy. I think that will take a lot of the poisonous rancor out of the uh, system and eliminate real arbitrariness and, 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 the, uh, and the fact that, you know, when, when people unfortunately, you know, pass away, that's not, you know, who knows, it, it, it's random and, and, and our system shouldn't be that random. Okay. John? I would feel like Admiral Stockdale back in the 92 election, I'd be like, why am I here? <laughs> you know, how did I get on this commission? <laughs> Biden must be losing it, you put me on it. But I, I, I'm against constitutional amendments. I mean, I, I understand uh, Mike's position on the term limits idea and fixing the number. I just get worried whenever we change anything in the constitution. Um, I also, I, I, you know, I, I don't know whether um, age really is interfering with judicial performance. Uh, that would be to me uh, the reason to have term limits. But I've always, I've actually been attracted to this more radical idea, but I don't think it requires constitutional amendment, which is, mm -hmm. I think sometimes the problem is that Supreme Court justices uh, get kind of trapped in their bubble. They issued these decisions. They never have to live under them. Uh, so I've always liked the idea, if you look at the Constitution, it only requires one chief justice. And so there's been this idea, I think that's popped up now and then, of why not make the other eight justices, uh, um, why not make the, select them from the rest of the federal judges and the rest of the country, have them come serve for a year, and then go back to being judges in the lower courts, mm -hmm. so that they have to live under the laws and even apply the decisions that they issued as Supreme Court justices, and that they would, you know, you could even make it a lottery and, you know, pull them from all over the country so that they represent the full diversity of our, uh, you know, our great nation. I always thought that would be a much more interesting and beneficial change to the court. Uh, interesting idea. Uh, I think you would have probably a less accomplished Supreme Court if we did it that way, but, uh, but, but probably one that's more uh, representative. And, you know, I do worry that they are in their own uh, cocoon. Okay. Uh, would the two of you like to take a few questions from the audience? Gotcha. Sure. Okay. First question comes from Michael Otten, who asked, quote, what was the rationale for the Supreme Court even taking a position on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision on what ballots to accept? Is that entirely the purview of the state courts? Uh, I'd be happy to take that since I'm from Pennsylvania and I'm a member of the bar and I actually been reading these decisions. Uh, uh, although I don't think Pennsylvania is unique in that this is going to come up in a lot of places. But basically, right, the state legislature under the U.S. Constitution and under the Pennsylvania Constitution sets the date of election and how you count the ballots and what counts as an absentee ballot and all the rules. The question that's popping up first in Pennsylvania, but all these other states is, can the state court come in and change that date because of COVID, because of all the emergencies that, are gonna, that have arisen because of COVID, the post office being uh, maybe slower, uh, maybe so many more absentee ballots are coming in and these states, Pennsylvania used to have a hard uh, test to be to get an absentee ballot. So these electoral bodies are not familiar with how to count that many ballots and so on. Right. Uh, so the Mostly that's an issue of state law. I think that's why the Supreme Court ultimately didn't take it. But there's actually a federal law question in there too, which is the constitution does give the power to choose how to select the electors to the state legislature. And so there is, I think, an important constitutional question, which is, and it was sort of in there in Florida 2002, which is, can the state courts interfere with the rules that the state legis legislature sets mm -hmm. for holding a presidential election? 
Well, I, th I think the, there is a simple rule that should be applied in all of these cases, which is the, the uh, pre-existing law governs and, and the courts do not have the right to make up new rules in the middle of the election. Doesn't matter whether they favor Republicans, favor Democrats, uh, the rules of the game should, are, should be treated as fixed. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Jeremy Joseph, and this ties into what you were uh, saying earlier about the justices and the bubble. Uh, his question, quote, the presence of conservative and liberal justices and the predictability of which justices will vote together seems to indicate that they are not solely considering the law when deciding on cases. Are most or all of the Supreme Court justices unelected politicians who make the unpopular decisions that Congress refuses to? Uh, I, the answer to that is not as much as you'd think. I mean, I, I can't, uh, obviously there's some of that, uh, but uh, two things. One is that the US Supreme Court decides only about you know, 60, 70 cases. They are the hardest cases. They are the ones in which courts below have divided. They are usually the cases in which it isn't clear. There is no necessarily one correct answer or, or not. And so it's, you know, it's not surprising that uh, they would, you know, that they would divide. Secondly, is that the Supreme Court, in spite of how hard these, this particular slice of the docket is, are decide cases by either unanimous or overwhelming, like seven to two votes, in and in a remarkably high uh, a number of cases. And there's even a certain number number of cases in which there's a 5-4 division, but with, um, with some members, you know, members appointed by different parties in the majority. So it's, it's not quite as extreme as the question suggests. Okay. I've just Go had ahead. on top, uh, you know, uh, to further that point, and it's not when uh, we, we think of politics being involved in the court. I don't think it's partisan politics of the Republican Democrat nature. It's a different kind of politics. It's a difference of uh, ideology. I, I think there's two big differences. One is how do you interpret a provision that's ambiguous? Do you look to the uh, founding understanding or, the, or that of the Civil War Reconstruction period, the people who wrote and ratified that amendment or wrote ratified that constitutional provision? Or do you think that you can kind of update constitutional meaning and turn, uh, to, be a, to be up with the times? And then the second thing I think divides them is the role of the judge. I think Mike uh, mentioned earlier, he thought, he hoped uh, that the Trump appointments would be exercise a fair amount of restraint and leave a lot of questions to the political process. I think that's often in, you know, hand in hand with originalism. And I think those who want to update the constitution, they sometimes think of the judge as a kind of heroic figure who is there to prod society on uh, to promote uh, change. Uh, the, always the problem I always have that is just which direction and who gave the judge that job. Okay, we have a question that's going to appeal to the law professor and both of you. Uh, Christopher Cummings writes, quote, can you comment on the theory of originalism? Is this a real theory and how is it practically applied when the founders often did not agree? He adds, written from a non-lawyer. Uh, so I teach a seminar on originalism. I, uh, I call it originalism and its critics because it's important you know, that law school classes not be propagandistic. Uh, and I, I believe that originalism is a real thing and it's been with us from the beginning, but it isn't the only thing. That is, uh, I think those people who say that all you have to do is look to the opinions of those who, uh, who drafted and ratified uh, a, a provision are, haven't done enough history um, what I think originalism can and should do is limit the range of interpretation to those that are plausibly within uh, the range of meaning, but sometimes uh, that's going to leave you some choice. And, and the next most important thing after that is subsequent practice and precedent. Uh, so that judges should first look to the text in light of its original meaning, but if there are ambiguities left, see how the nation and the courts have interpreted the provision in the past. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, I, I, I'm an originalist, uh, and I think it's mostly because of what Churchill said about democracy. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a great theory, but all the other theories are much worse. 
So uh, I don't teach a course on originalism. I don't think a lot about interpretive theory. I do teach a class on the founding and just the history of the revolution through the early national period. And the question is quite right. The founders sometimes disagreed about very important issues. Sometimes they immediately disagreed right after the constitution about the meaning of these provisions. But the, what's the alternative? Is the alternative then to allow judges to sort of say, well, what we think you know, emoluments means or what we think uh, you know, free speech means is what those words mean to us today. I think that's a very um, uh, tempting theory for judges because it concentrates a lot of power in the judiciary. They're very hard to overturn. You can only return them with a constitutional amendment or changing uh, the people on the Supreme Court and it has the effect of removing a lot of decisions from the, the uh, political process. Right. Uh, this is a popular topic on our thread, by the way. Sorry to cut you off, John. Uh, Sergio, I saw your question on this. I hope uh, they answered it. Uh, but Mark Kwan also wrote uh, to you, John. He said, John, if you're against changing the Constitution, how does that work with the philosophy of originalism? How is this, how is this the Constitution or interpretation of it supposed to change over time? So this is the difficult problem with originalism. So I think there are, I think one answer is that uh, orig if you believe in original understanding, you have to accept, I think, that the founders thought some provisions were not going to be fixed. So the due process clause, I think famously uh, is, I don't think the founders thought, oh, the due process, due process means exactly this and only this and can never incorporate new ideas of fairness in procedure. Some people think the Ninth Amendment right, it refers to uh, rights, which are not written down in the, in the Bill of Rights, but could be um, incorporated in some way. Uh, I happen to think the, the executive power, uh, it has that feature to it too. Uh, the presidential uh, power, particularly in crises and war and emergencies has that flavor to it. Um, so I, I think that's what the other means is, I think unfortunately, uh, if there is a constitutional provision that's clear and we know the original understanding of the founders about it, then if you want to update constitutional meaning, you do it the way the constitution sets out, which is through constitutional amendment. Uh, and then the third point I just make is, I think the problem is as the court has extended its reach over more and more issues, we tend to think, oh, the only way to change that is through a constitutional amendment or through changing the personnel on the court. But if the court were more properly restrained in the way Mike mentioned, then the way you would change most of these things would just be through the political process. If the courts played a much more narrow role, then the way you generally update our political system and the way we do things is just by going to win elections and, and negotiating in the legislature. And we would give a much more a much broader scope to politics rather than I think the narrow one that we're currently living under. Michael, here's a question from John Engler. He asked, quote, what are the prospects for the Supreme Court to rein in district judges who have expanded the role of the judiciary by dramatically increasing their use of nationwide injunctions? Um, I think the odds of that happening are extremely high. Uh, in fact, we've already seen it to, to a considerable degree. The issue here, by the way, for people who don't f follow this uh, is that uh, during the Obama administration, there were a couple of examples before that, but it was really during the Obama administration that it started happening that judges, district judges, would have a case in front of them involving, you know, a single party, uh, and then instead of giving relief to that party, which who was really the only person entitled to the relief, they would issue injunctions that covered the entire country, which means often on a preliminary basis. So you could, you, people, a plaintiff would, would rush to a favorable court choosing, you know, the part of the country where they're going to get the most, uh, uh, the judge who's most likely to be on their side. Uh, and then the entire operation of the government uh, could be stopped. The whole the decisions of the political branches can be stopped during the months and years that it can take uh, to, uh, to get that reversed. Uh, that I think is widely regarded uh, as an abuse. And I think already you see that, uh, that courts of appeals are reversing uh, nationwide injunctions and narrowing them. And I'm very confident that in, a, in an appropriate case, the Supreme Court would do that. I wouldn't be surprised if that will be unanimous. I don't think this is the left-right issue. This was done to Obama, this was done to Trump, and it is uh, 
uh, it's something that does need to be reined in. Okay, I have uh, two questions I want to kind of roll into one because they are related. Michael Glennon asks, how would you expect a Justice Barrett to come down on issues of presidential power and separation of powers? And the question I'd like to link that to, gentlemen, is one from Bert Levy, who uh, asks, um, I totally agree with your position regarding the independence of the Trump judges. However, the liberal judges invariably vote as a block. So ideologically, why is there no reciprocity? In other words, why don't why don't all the Trump uh, judges vote the same, whereas you see, say, the Clinton judges, Obama judges voting the same? Well, I'll take the executive power question and leave the reciprocity to John. Oh, uh, man! <laughs> I, I grabbed this because I have a book which is uh, literally out right now. It is uh, just being distributed by the uh, Princeton University Press uh, with the title of The President Who Would Not Be King. And I argue based upon the history of the uh, formation of the constitution that uh, not across the board, but that at least in many respects, uh, the, the unilateral power of the presidency has been uh, expanded beyond uh, what any possible uh, original understanding would support. And therefore, if I had to guess, uh, Amy Barrett will probably agree with me. She's a smart lady. All right, John, explain why conservatives don't vote as a block. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. This is, you left me the much more easy question. <laughs> um, so I, it's actually, it's interesting. I read a statistic. So since 1968, Republican presidents appointed the vast majority of Supreme Court justices. Uh, right. Democratic presidents have only appointed four. Right? Uh, and until a few uh, months ago, all four of them were on the court together, right? Ginsburg, Breyer, Soto, Kagan, and Sotomayor. Right. Uh, Republican presidents appointed all the other ones. And so you've had a lot, I think the, the, the idea of the question I think is right, you've had a lot of presidents, Republican presidents who were trying to pick conservative justices, pick uh, nominees who ended up be sometimes becoming the leader of the liberal side of the court, like uh, John Paul Stevens, I would say, is a or Harry Blackman or David Souter, or justices who were uh, in the middle, and even just by being in the middle, were disappointing to conservatives like uh, uh, Tony Kennedy or Sandra Day O'Connor, or going back before that, Lewis Powell. Uh, so why is that? So there's a lot of there. There's a, and, and I think it's quite right that descriptively, I think the um, liberal justices do tend to vote more as a block on important controversial cases. On less controversial cases, sometimes you might see Breyer or Kagan uh, join the concerns, particularly on administrative law or criminal law issues. But in general, I think it's right on uh, high profile cases, they tend to vote as a block. A hard, hard question is why that is. So uh, the judge I clerked for and Judge Barrett clerked for, uh, Larry Silverman, the DC Circuit, he once called this the greenhouse effect because he was teasing right. Linda Greenhouse, who was the New York Times Supreme Court reporter. His argument was, if you drift to the middle or even over to the left, the uh, bubble of Washington gives heaps praise upon you for growing in, growing in office. But if you are conservative, you're seen as a bitter, angry justice living in a cave. You don't get, ele you don't get invited to speak at fancy lectures and go to law schools or go abroad. Uh, all the culture and the political system and the media rewards you for moving to them. I don't know how true that is, it does. I don't know, it seems to track with some of the outcomes, but uh, uh, you could also say, look, the thing that did change was uh, with Trump and a little bit with Bush is, uh, you know, Mike was one of those judges that President George W. Bush appointed is he appointed people who are much more known quantities. Uh, you know, Mike was picked because he's one of the leading originalists in the country at the time of his appointment. Uh, now he wants to give everybody term limits to kick them off the court. But back in his younger days, he wasn't so radical. and. Um, Back before those judges, back in the Reagan years or the Nixon years, for example, uh, they were trying to pick stealth candidates about which they thought, oh, these are wink, wink, nod, nod, they're really conservative, but they have no record, so we'll push them through. And it turned out the reason they didn't have a record was because they hadn't really thought about a lot of these things before. Right. So I think that's a large part of what's happened too. Okay, here is a question that is also an entire course at Berkeley or Stanford. Uh, Leonard Pepper asked, what is the future of co-equal branches? Well, I think that there is no doubt 
that Congress has atrophied uh, in recent years and maybe decades. Uh, and much of this is due to the hyperpolarization of our political parties now that the they, so that members of Congress do not act as if they are senators, uh, but rather as Democrats or Republicans. And then we have the problem of each party has a more extreme wing that will uh, sort of hold its majority hostage uh, to positions that can't command an entire majority. And the result is the, of this is that it's very hard for Congress to actually legislate and the president has moved into the uh, vacuum. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, I would add on to that. I, I agree with what Mike has said about Congress's decline. A lot of political scientists have noticed that too. I think the other big change, if you brought the founders, for, you know, founders who designed the separation of powers and wrote about it, you brought them in a time machine to today, showed them a government. The other thing they would say looks really strange would be the vast administrative state and how independent it is from anybody's control. Uh, you know, this is the victory, I think, of the 20th century progressive, not the progressive as it's were used now, but the progressive constitution of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and ultimately FDR was just uh, the idea that all important questions should be decided by experts who should be insulated and protected from politics. Right. Uh, and I think that would have appeared really strange to the founders who thought of, right, we elect politicians, those politicians directly control the government and they're responsible uh, to us. So how did I, you know, one, one, just one point I would make about that is that it's not a one-way ratchet, I would say. It does seem like that. I think the question assumes that, like, oh, we've seen these changes like the administrative state, the decline of Congress, and that's just the way it's going to be. I don't think that's necessarily true. I would say for the Supreme Court, for example, which used to bless these arrangements, one of the things of, uh, I think one of the themes of the Roberts Court is that it's been steadily chipping away at the idea that there should be an independent administrative state. They've been striking down a lot of agencies lately and right. saying you have to go back under the model of presidential control of the Administ of administration at least, and at least you're responsible to the president and we can hold the president accountable through elections. Jim Hartley asked kind of interesting sort of offbeat question. He asked, what role does the media play? He says, TV, magazine, web, informing the American public's impression of the Supreme Court for good and bad. And uh, let me build on that a little bit. Um, there has not been an Aaron Sorkin treatment of the Supreme Court as he did with the West Wing. In other words, we haven't had a running TV drama glorifying. Because they need, they need ratings. No one would ever watch a show that boring. Right. That said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was turned into a genuine cult figure thanks to media, the glorification of her, if you will. So it was, I think that's what he's getting out with this question. So um, let's, your thoughts, gentlemen, on how the media covers the courts and also what aspects of the court you think the media could do a better job of explaining? <laughs> well, I wish the media would treat court cases as legal disputes and tell us what the legal arguments are, rather than treating them all about, go, they go immediately to the outcome is, you know, do you like abortion or not? Do you like same-sex marriage or not? Uh, what do you think of the Affordable Care Act? Um, whereas what comes before the court is, here's a statute, here are the words, here's the history. Uh, and that's really, the fact that the media basically ignores the legal issue. I very frequently, you know, see a story like in the New York Times about a legal case and I'm curious, oh, what is the argument here? And I'll read the entire story and not be able to figure out what the argument is because the journalists just apparently don't think that the, that the law makes any difference what I wish for too in the media, if I say a second wish would be that they uh, not make it about Republican versus Democrat outcomes. You know, they always say, oh, the Republican justices voted this way and the Democratic justices voted that way. If there is a difference, it's really over uh, this approach to interpreting the constitution. I think that's much more important than whether they're voting for Trump or voting for an outcome that Obama would have wanted. Okay, gentlemen, one final question. I don't think this is going to be a very elaborate answer uh, from either of you. Donald Wilson asked, senators, representatives, and the president are elected by the public, supposedly. Is it far-fetched to have the judges of the Supreme Court elected by the public? 
Well, we've tried that in most of the states. A majority of the states has a system uh, where right, we elect the, the Supreme Court. We elect in California, we elect all the way down to the trial courts. Uh, and you can, in some states, you even have partisan, you know, partisan uh, platforms with a Republican or progressive Green Party, you know, putting you know, saying, I, I, I um, worry about that because how do you campaign for office as a judge? Um, you might do the things that the Senate, the Senate Judiciary Committee wanted Judge Barrett to do or Justice Ginsburg to do to make promises about what they would do <laughs> when they actually had cases on certain subjects. So there's something about that that I think really conflicts with the idea of a judge being neutral, deciding the case based on the facts and the law when it comes to them rather than pre-judging it. On the other hand, I think it's okay for states in a way to do it because states give their judges far more policymaking power over things like contracts and accident law and so on, family law, than we are we supposedly give to our federal judges. Michael? Uh, I would be very opposed to making uh, judges elected, federal judges elected. Of course, states have authority to set up their own judiciaries as they, as they see fit. Uh, but you know, I believe the best form of government is one in which the driving force is democratic, but in which there are some checks and balances which are less so. And I do not want judges deciding, they should be deciding cases on the basis of law rather than on the basis of popularity and how people will uh, will respond. Michael, I'm shocked. I would have thought that you, having been a judge in a past life, would have jumped at the chance to run a campaign and have to raise <laughs> money and stretch yourself out on the couch and all the wonderful things we put candidates. Sounds in. enticing. Uh, well, Maybe John, you will do it for us instead. So gentlemen, that's gonna be it for Q&A and I'd like to end this by having each of you just kind of make a brief little closing statement, closing remarks. And I'd like you to comment on this, um, assuming that Justice, Judge Barrett becomes Justice Barrett on Monday, we're now looking at the six to three court. So just kind of briefly encapsulate the significance of the six three court versus the five four court. Michael, why don't you go first? So, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that the replacement of Ruth Bader Ginsburg by someone to her right is going to result in the court uh, having fewer left-wing uh, decisions. But I don't think we're going to experience any kind of a, of a, uh, of a revolution. Uh, I, the court is a very slow-moving institution. Um, <laughs> For all the fact that Democrats were claiming the opposite, Judge Barrett's r academic writings actually defend the importance of story decisis and precedent. Uh, she's not going to be a, a, a bomb thrower. I think the main effect is going to be fewer left-wing escapades. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sort of peculiar lurches to the right. Okay, John. I, I definitely agree with that. I think the question is, uh, in addition to a sort of halt to creative judicial decisions uh, in a liberal direction is uh, how far uh, is the court going to go in revisiting old questions? Uh, and uh, just as a more tactical matter, how much power will Chief Justice Roberts have anymore to play as kind of middle role? For example, this year he uh, joined with the liberal justices uh, on several important cases, uh, such as the DACA, DAPA case, or there was an abortion case out of Louisiana, where I would think the outcome would have been the other way mm -hmm. if Judge Barrett were on the court. So I, the two issues I see that I think are you, you would see this would be uh, the rights of religious minorities. Mm -hmm. There's a case on the court's docket right now about whether to throw out an old precedent, almost 30 years old, written by Justice Scalia, uh, which had the effect of narrowing the rights of religious minorities. And the other area I think would be gun rights. As you may know, the Supreme Court has never taken another case about the individual right to bear arms since the case is about 15 years ago, where it said for the first time, the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms. And one of her most important opinions as a lower court judge was uh, expanding actually the right of the uh, individual gun owners as against state regulation. So I could see that obviously becoming uh, an issue where she could play an important role and the court might become much more active there than it has been. Okay. 
Michael and John, I sure appreciate the conversation. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you were brilliant as always. I'd like to thank those of you for watching, for also tuning in, and uh, those of you who asked questions, thank you very much. Uh, those of you who asked questions I couldn't get to, sorry, just not enough time, but maybe Michael and John will come back and we'll do this another day because it's not like the Supreme Court is going away as a topic. So our next Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing uh, won't be for a little while because there is an election coming up. We'll be back on Tuesday, November the 17th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Again, that's 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday the 17th, two weeks after the election. And the conversation will be with David Brady and Doug Rivers. The topic of the briefing will be the 2020 election, what the polls did and didn't get right. Now, about our two guests that day, Dave Brady is the Hoover Institution's Davies Family Senior Fellow, as well as the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor of Political Science at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's one of America's most respected political scientists. Doug Rivers, likewise, is a Hoover Institution Senior Fellow and a Stanford University political scientist. He's also the Chief Scientist at YouGov PLC, the global online polling firm. And in fact, if you're watching CBS News on election night and look out there in the bullpen, I'll those people scrambling away, crunching data, you will see Doug Rivers in action. So we'll talk in part about what it's like to be in New York, where he is right now in quarantine, I believe, getting ready for election day. Uh, it will be a very lively talk uh, about the art and science of polling. So please make sure to tune into it um, as one of the big questions in this election is going to be whether the forecasts are correct or we're in for another surprise come election day. So again, thanks for joining us. On behalf of my colleagues, Michael McConnell and John Yu, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, please, by all means, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll do our best on this end to help you stay informed. We'll see you soon.